present to you. Uh, here we have five early career dramaturgs, each very different, each very skilled. And when I put the panel together, I challenge them to do a few different things. One, I want them to introduce themselves because it drives me crazy when someone introduces the panel. I like it when people decide how they want to present themselves. So they will be introducing themselves. I ask them to choose three tactics or strategies for moving from the academy into the profession. And then I ask them to highlight one of the projects that they're most proud of or most excited about. Sound good? We're all on the same page? Yep. Great. I've given them each 10 minutes maximum, and they will be timed by our <laughs> lovely timekeeper. So that it's, if you see this, you're at nine minutes. If you see this, you need to stop. Yeah. All right. And then we, that will leave us time for questions afterwards. Right. So anything, any questions before we begin? You're all in the right place. This is where you intended to be. All right. Great. So Aaron, go ahead. Great. Um, I'm Aaron, uh, he, him. I have a bio I'm going to read to you. Um, <laughs> I'm a Hamilton board theater maker and I'm a graduate of York uh, University's theater studies program. I'm currently the dramaturgy intern at Cahoots Theater. Um, I'm there on a PTTP grant, which is a professional theater training program grant from Theater Ontario. So I'm getting paid for it, which is always exciting. Um, I, I'm wear I work in a bunch of things. I wear a bunch of hats. I actually started as um, a playwright and director. Um, I only started dramaturgy very recently because when I was in Judith's program in theater school, I was just in as a playwright. My partner was in the program and she was a, a dramaturg, so this dramaturgy thing is kind of new to me, so I've been kind of thrust in it in the past year or so. Um, so you asked us for three strategies, wow, <laughs> Strat we're already off to a great start. You asked me for three strategies out of the academy. I, I have more of a rambling story, so it might be good and it might be weird, so we'll begin. Um, I'm from Hamilton, Ontario, which is a town um, an hour south of here that doesn't really have that developed a theatre community. Um, Hamilton is in a weird situation where you have an indie community, which is um, community theatre, and you also have a regional theatre, which programs works from abroad. So there's no real space for indie theatre. So the weird thing about Hamilton is a bunch of theatre grads go and they become hobbyists. They just vanish into the woodwork, they just do community theatre and they're stuck there forever. So my dramaturgy process in getting work is led by fear, because I don't want to go home. So, because it's led by fear, um, in my final year of York, I was in a conundrum. I had finished all of my theater courses, I had a year full of science electives, and I was like, I'm screwed. I'm going back to Hamilton, I'm going to be in Maryland, we roll along, this is going to be my life. So the first thing I did was I allied myself with a Fujian Asian Canadian theater. Um, I messaged them, I got into their playwriting unit, and I tried to volunteer at every single thing they did because I really wanted to connect with a professional theatre company before I left school. So there would be kind of a safety net the moment I left school. So that was the first really big tactic I had. My second tactic was doing the Fringe Festival. Um, I've discovered that the Fringe, in Toronto at least, is the general for theatre makers. Um, I know artistic directors who scout dramaturgs, who scout lighting designers, who scout playwrights from the Toronto Fringe. More so than their actual general auditions, which fascinates me. Um, so after that, I invited uh, Nina Lee Aquino um, to it, and she met with me and gave me feedback, and then invited me into her director's training program. That director's training program then led to, at the end of the year, we had to direct a workshop of one of the artists in residence. From there, I kind of started getting a taste for dramaturgy, because I never th thought I could direct new work that wasn't my own, because I'm one of those directors who directs his own work, which is bad. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll just let that one sink in. But, yeah. And that's kind of how it started for me, because I had that hands-on training with Nina, and Nina was generous enough to continue the mentorship on for another year. So I got to shadow uh, the production of Age of Arousal there. I got to shadow her on some projects. I got to attend master classes. And that's kind of where I developed, I'm not saying my toolkit, but just how I approach developing new work. Um, after that, uh, I met Marjorie Chan at a barbecue, and she offered for dramaturgy experience. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. Like, if I have one skill, it's forming relationships with ADs and being in the right place at the right time and also not seeming like a parasite. I think that's, that's one of like, the things I'm very aware of that I have a tendency to do this. It's how do you form authentic relationships with artistic directors and mentors without just asking them for help? Because I've had it happen to me, I've definitely done it to other people, and that's something I'm developing. So I guess my first point is, for my strategy, is do a fringe and invite ADs and curate relationships. 
because that's kind of what's paid my way and what's gotten me from opportunity to opportunity. Um, my second thing is to seek out mentorships when I don't know what to do. Um, as I said, I live in fear most of my life. I walk outside and it's raining and I scream for a while and close my window. Um, but also, more <laughs> importantly, um, as a dramaturg of color, I know I'm invited to certain rooms that other dramaturgs aren't because there's less of me. That being said, though, that means I have to be really, really, really good. Otherwise, I'm going to let those people down. Um, one of the realities I've realized as a creator of color is that our work is often infantilized um, in that if you're any visible minority or any minority whatsoever, um, you always are seen as that play. It's like, oh, you're doing that Chinese play. You're doing that queer play. You're doing that black play. So in order to fight that, I have to be training in everything so when a playwright approaches me with something, I can respond to that, or I know that department, or I can do enough sufficient research as to that forum to make sure it works. So I'd say, see how those relationships, but also seek out training in what you don't know. Um, my friend told me a story um, recently. Um, she was training with a salsa dancer, and she realized that he was no longer a good mentor for her, because they went to a sales class, she asked him if he wanted to go again, and he was like, no. I'm tired of feeling like an amateur. And that was the moment she stepped away from him because she realized he was no longer asking questions about his process and no longer learning new skills. So I think that's something that, like, because I live in this constant state of fear, I'm always asking questions and always trying to fill those holes. Um, my third kind of strategy for getting work, I guess, is that I don't work for free. Um, that was something I'm very, very adamant about. Um, if no one's paying me, I'm going to find a way to get funding to support myself there. Going back to this Hamilton thing, I'm from a town full of hobbyists who work for free. If I get into that mindset, my, to me, my work doesn't have any value. Um, and also, since I'm an incredibly lazy person, I need to trick myself into taking things seriously. One of the ways to trick myself into taking things seriously is asking for payment. Because then, the person paying me is trusting me with their work on a financial level, so I have to up the ante by reaching them at that level. So I guess the long and short of it is, my three steps for getting work are not being a hobbyist and finding ways to not return to my hometown, or if I do return to my hometown, finding a way to sufficiently pay myself and the artists I employ. Um, a project I worked on recently, I just kind of worked my way through there. I'm very impressed with myself. Um, a project I worked on recently was actually at this conference yesterday, um, the Mother Tongue Project. I was their dramaturg yesterday, uh, not yesterday, but I was their drama, I was not here yesterday. Um, but in May, I was brought on to dramaturg that project. Um, I had produced that project with my collective Then They Fight Theater um, as part of a de development series, but they asked me to come back in May because they wanted to pitch it to ADs and pitch it to companies to develop them further. So what they presented me with was 10 hours of research which they performed verbatim, which is a lot for a play. Um, and they, they wanted my help to find a through line. That's a tangent. We're going to jump to another tangent. Uh, one of my favorite plays is a play by David E. called Acquiesce, because David E.'s stage directions are amazing. Uh, one of David's stage directions says, the main character's name is Sin, and in one scene, the stage direction reads, the hole in Sin's heart grows bigger. And I'm like, what does that mean? So then I went back to the mother tongue, and I was like, oh, that's just how I anchor the way I work as a dramaturg. Um, to me, if we're obeying a Western conflict-driven plot structure, which is very different from an Eastern uh, non-conflict-driven plot structure, to me, it's a character with a hole in their heart, or a creator with a hole in their heart, trying to fill that hole by going on a journey, by f doing things to successfully fill that hole or find another hole that exists. So going back to Mother Tongue now, 100 hours of research, they were really confused, I was really confused, I was very scared because I'd never drawn a or docu piece, but then I realized, I was like, oh, just go back to that question. What's the hole? What's missing? So I asked them up front, I'm like, so, so why are you doing this play? What's missing? What, what was missing from that hole in your heart that you're trying to fill with this play? And then everything just kind of figured itself out. So I think that, like, if, if to end my section, going back from a point of fear, um, which I'm in a constant state of fear, as I've said many times, um, I always go back to that whole thing whenever I approach a piece of theater. Why are, why are those creators doing that play? Or if so, why is that character going on that journey? And what is missing from that character's heart that drags them to the journey? Which brings me back to a point I forgot. Um, my fourth criteria, I guess, of how do I secure work is that I only work on projects that I really care about, which is kind of like a no-brainer, but I also really believe that because I don't believe in patting your resume, just because I think the reason I do get work and opportunities is because when people see one of my shows or a show I've worked on, they know that everyone has been fully in, that I've tricked myself into working on it with my fullest, but also that because I worked on that show, I believed in it. 
So in that way, because of those four criteria, I've kind of catered and um, curated the way I work. So when my name's on a project, people know it kind of fall, not, doesn't follow an aesthetic, but follows something, a core principle that I believe in. So yeah, I guess if you can take away anything from my 10 minutes, it's that um, I will not be returning to Hamilton, and I'm very afraid. <laughs> but it motivates me, because I think a fear for a lot of theater grads is that we become hobbyists. Especially new out of school, we work for profit share, we work the job job and that consumes us. But I think as an early career dramaturg, if we demand payment, and if someone doesn't pay us but we believe in the project, if we seek out other ways to fund it, then it still makes us feel like we're doing the work, because we are and we're getting paid. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Colette Radeau, and my pronouns are she and her. Uh, I'm originally from Alberta, where I grew up on a farm, one hour north of Calgary, and two hours south of Edmonton. I'm an emerging freelance dramaturg, as well as a performer and director. Last year, I graduated from York University, where I specialized in new play dramaturgy and devised theater. So the three steps that took me to, um, that moved me from university to professional work were, Number one, doing dramaturgy work before knowing what dramaturgy actually was. Number two, connecting with peers who wanted to write or create new work. Number three, connecting with a mentor in the industry. So, step one, um, even if you haven't formally studied dramaturgy, that doesn't mean you can't start honing your craft. Even before I attended York and I took the two-year series of courses in new play dramaturgy taught by Judith, I was curious about it while I was studying acting at Red Deer College in Alberta. For acting practicums, we often had to do research projects on the play, playwright, and world of the play of whatever production we, we were acting in. In my second year of college, my friends and I got into the Edmonton Fringe Festival. We wanted to do a devised show. My friend who was going to direct the piece asked me to be the dramaturg, and I said yes, having no idea what new play dramaturgy was and how different it was from production dramaturgy. But from this process, I learned that I have good instincts, an observant eye, and I knew how to ask provocative questions. I continue to do new play dramaturgy while studying at York, dramaturgy work in development by my playwriting classmates, as well as other peers and old college classmates who are submitting work to festivals. And what I learned was that you can't really know how to dramaturge until you try it. The best way to learn and see if it's something you really want to pursue as a career is to work with as many people as possible and practice, practice, practice. Even practicing your play analysis skills can be so helpful and learning how to articulate what you see as an audience member and what choices you think do or don't serve a piece is vital in developing your skills as a dramaturg. Step two, um, find people who are interested in writing or producing plays. Then let people know you're a dramaturg because, to put it bluntly, the writing process is hard and people want help. And then let word of mouth spread from there. For me, being part of a playwriting dramaturgy program made it easy to create connections with peers who wanted to write plays. And thanks to that word of mouth, I've been lucky in that most of the work I've done up to this point has been people approaching me looking for a dramaturg. Uh, and I also had a lot of friends in devised theater courses at York who wanted to create new work for festivals but weren't necessarily in the playwriting program. So um, one of these festivals is the Playground Festival at York, which is a student-run festival of new works and development. And participating in this festival allowed me to collaborate with others and continue to practice my dramaturgical skills outside the classroom. I think continually building your resume, even while in school, can give you the upper hand of having practical experience to bring into the professional world. If you're an emerging dramaturg who's interested in new play development and dramaturgy, I can't stress enough how important it is to get involved with theater festivals. So many of these festivals are fantastic platforms for being able to experiment, collaborate, and try new things and get some production experience under your belt. And having a new play be put up in front of an audience and actually be seen and heard can be one of the most useful development tools for playwrights and dramaturgs. Additionally, working on plays that are 15, 30, or 45 minutes in length feels much less daunting than trying to develop full-length plays, especially as an emerging theater creator. Yeah. What I learned is that creating these bonds early in your theater career is so important because people that you've worked with once will like, more than likely end up being people that you'll work with again and again. Working on lots of different projects is great, but I think it's even better to find other people in school who have the same interests, aesthetics, and opinions on theater as you do, and continue to work with them. Doing this helped me foster lifelong creative partnerships. Step three. During my last year of school, my professor Judith told me about the Playwrights Guild of Canada's Creator Exchange, where emerging and established dramaturgs and playwrights could connect and network. 
I ended up connecting with Stephen Kolela, dramaturg and associate artistic director at Young People's Theatre here in Toronto. I had developed a relationship with Young People's Theatre over the years, having done an educational programming internship while I was in college, as well as having spent some time volunteering as a drama school assistant. After the Guild Exchange, I reached out to Stephen to see if he would be interested in taking me on as a script reader. By reading and discussing unsolicited script submissions with Stephen, I began to learn about the roles and responsibilities of a company dramaturg and how these are very different from being a freelance dramaturg. As well, Stephen invited me to sit in on professional play workshops at YPT, which gave me insight into the new play workshop process, <coughs> which I didn't have a lot of experience in other than our playwriting class, when the players would bring in work and we would discuss it. Recently, I participated in a three-week workshop at YPT developing a new play by Mary Ellen McLean about dyslexia. This was a really valuable experience for me in that I was able to work with a playwright like Mary Ellen who uses devised and physical theater methods to create her work. Working with a professional mentor in the industry is one of the best ways for any emerging artist to bridge the gap from school into their profession. And if you hadn't had the opportunity to train in dramaturgy like I did, I would highly encourage you for your next step to look into non-institutional training and mentorship programs. This type of experience can be so valuable in a profession like dramaturgy where having practical knowledge and experience is vital to the work. So a recent professional dramaturgy project I did this year was Dramaturging and Co-Directing Midnight Toronto, which premiered at this year's Rhubarb Festival at Buddies and Bad Times Theatre. This process began at the end of last summer when my colleague from New York, Curtis Tabrink, asked me to dramaturg and co-direct a play he had written with the best in mind. His concept for the show was to create a post-apocalyptic concert with storytelling by a three-person band about the end of Toronto as we know it. The festival focuses on producing new experimental art in a variety of mediums and genres, most pieces being about 25 minutes in length. He wanted the piece to involve live music and soundscape created by the actors in an integral way, which was something that neither of us had much experience or knowledge in, but something we were both excited about. Rhubarb seemed like the right kind of setting to take this sort of creative risk in our work. Having almost no music training, I had no idea how to dramaturg or direct any kind of music element, but I've always loved live music and theater that incorporates live soundscapes, which brings me back to step one about doing stuff that you have no idea how to do, but just trying it. As both dramaturg and co-director, I had to bring in more of my production dramaturgy skills and think about how to create a script where the text and sounds would complement each other instead of just repeating information we already knew. With a doomsday type of text that includes sounds of sirens and helicopters, as well as romantic queer scenes and allowing you to return to a pastoral, pre-industrial world, we had to figure out how to balance gentle acoustic underscoring alongside indie rock songs composed by Daniel Vick for the show. During rehearsal, when we come across a word or a sentence that invoked a sound, or if we wanted to underscore a monologue, we would experiment with our limited instruments of a keyboard, guitar, and microphones, and figure out what mood or tone we wanted to achieve. Working within a 25 minute time frame was also challenging, but luckily I had the experience of step two, working on new plays with other emerging artists, mainly in festival settings, to guide me. And this was by far one of the shortest time frames I've had to work in to get a script ready from page to stage to be developed for a scheduled production which required both new play dramaturgy and production dramaturgy simultaneously. This was a new experience for me and something I would love to continue doing in the future. By far this was the most creative and artistic I felt as a dramaturg. And what I learned as I continued to shape my dramaturgy career is that I really want to continue developing works like this that involve me from start to finish during the creative process. I'm excited to see what the future has in store for me as I continue to emerge as a dramaturg. Thank you. Hi, I'm Saba Hawk. Um, I like to use the term creative producer to describe the kind of work I do because I'm one of like everyone else here. I've got a like just a bunch of hyphens next to my name. I found it very exhausting to keep repeating them. Um, and creative producer is a term I learned very recently in a training program I did at Generator called the Artist Producer Training Program, uh, which is a year-long paid uh, intensive mentorship program that's offered uh, to six to eight uh, emerging or new producers uh, who want to create new work in Toronto. Um, so I've done very similar things to Erin and Colette. 
Uh, so I apologize for repeating <laughs> some of my advice. Um, uh, so before I came into York and started Judith's class, I, I did a lot of youth programs uh, with Shakespeare in Action Theater, Soul Pepper Theater, and the TDSB Arts Co-op. So I took every opportunity I could to make some art in whatever I, way I could. Um, in high school, I did this year's drama festival where we devised our own work. So a lot of uh, creative co collaboration is in my background um, and it was just very clear to me what I wanted to do so I continued to pursue that at York. Um, I thought I wanted to be an actor for a while and uh, I very quickly realized that there was not much for me to act in as a performer of color and uh, like I just didn't want to be casted as the maid or the servant or the sister who doesn't have any lines or the best friend and, and it got very exhausting so I uh, started investing more of my time in, in devised work so I started the devised theater specialization uh, with Elise uh, and we also started the new play dramaturgy and playwriting program together um, where I, and I did that program as a playwright. Uh, concurrently with my degree, I produced uh, work with Paprika Festival, which is a youth-led, year-long mentorship uh, festival that culminates in a week-long performing arts uh, presentation of new work. Uh, so every year, I collaborated with new ensembles, with new mentors in the professional industry, and tried new things. Uh, and uh, in second year, uh, before I started the class with Judith, uh, I led my first, my very first creative process uh, that I produced, I led and I gathered my people and it was just a total dumpster fire. Uh, it was just a terrible mess because we just didn't know what we were doing and a lot of dramaturgical questions came up and we didn't know how to answer it. Um, thankfully, I had Elise to help me. She really saved the day, uh, and we managed to bring something uh, beautiful together. But even as I think about it, I just think of all the stupid things we did. Um, and to this day, Elise and I cringe about that show. Um, <laughs> so uh, I noticed uh, at York there were there are a lot of uh, white creators around me, and I didn't. Uh, like it didn't, it, it didn't feel like a big deal until after I graduated and I realized the rest of the world is pretty white too. And uh, I really, like while I, I felt very safe and very supported by Judith and Elise in my uh, playwriting journey, they helped me create my first play which I'm still developing. Um, every time, like they, for two years they were my support system and so I really owe the beginning of my playwriting career to Judith and this class and the support system we made. Um, and then graduating, that support system just existed back here and moving forward, I didn't know how to navigate those, uh, those spaces anymore. And I didn't know what I needed. Because um, Elise got super busy and invited me to do her master's, which you'll hear more about later. Um, so I, so I uh, kind of put a hold on my dramaturging and my new playwriting and started supporting other uh, artists of color to make their own work. And uh, that kind of became this uh, thing that lived more outside the rehearsal room, uh, which is something that I saw happen in the classroom with Judith. Uh, not only did our dramaturgs dramaturg our work, they also produced the events where we got to share it. Uh, so that's what I like to call creative producing. And I learned that from Ashlyn Rose, who is the creative producer at the Theater Center. And she had come and guest lectured at the Artist Producer Training Program at Generator. If you're interested in producing work, and, and that, that producing is a big, big term that has multiple meanings, I like super encourage you to check out Generator Toronto. They're an amazing resource for uh, independent artists. Uh, and so a lot of my training lives outside of formal institutionalized training and uh, really lives within mentorship. I'm really glad I went, went to York uh, 
despite uh, how challenging I found to work in a university uh, because I found so many mentors and collaborators I could create work with. Um, but I'm also really glad that I found institutions outside of the university model to uh, teach me and to give me practice rather than just talk about things. I did, like, I did a lot of things and I learned on the job pretty much. And, and I think that's how a lot of in indie artists learn in Toronto. And it, and it sounds like, it sounds weird, it sounded weird to me, but then I, I realized as I went on, pretty much everyone does that. Um, so aside from pursuing alternative education and mentorship opportunities, uh, I sought out people that I really wanted to work with um, and continue to work with. Uh, and organizations that I identified with. Um, so one of those organizations is Little Black Afro Theater, uh, and they do every year a program called the Emerging Artist Project, where they take on one or two uh, emerging artists and produce a workshop of their new play. Uh, and they're supported by uh, dramaturgs, a production manager, designers, actors, and Little Black Afro funds everything. and one of our mandates at the theater is to pay everyone for their work. Uh, so no one has to feel apologetic or insecure about the work that they're doing in the room. So everything around them is taken care of by the producers and then the artists can focus on the art. Um, yeah, so between those um, experiences, I really sat down in the arts management world and started building my grant writing skills and uh, my marketing skills and all those administrative skills we use to make a show happen. And over time, they've became really, really good. Like I can write a really good grant because I practiced um, and I had a lot of support in, in editing those grants. And, um, and I think it's such an important skill for new artists to have because that's how you're gonna get your work funded and if you don't get your work funded, you don't get your work up. And working for free is such a, such a terrible thing I totally did. And then decided to stop doing after I graduated. That's a hard line I put up. Um, but during, graduate, like during my undergraduate degree, I really did a lot of things for free. I asked a lot of people to do things for free. Um, and, and it made me feel kind of uneasy. Uh, except for knowing that yes we we will get experience from it but like you people need to live so uh, that's something i uh, put a hard i uh, made a hard decision about after i graduated so i've worked with elise um i talk about elise so much because i love her um i've worked with elise since we've graduated and she's continued to help me develop my play um and we've um, we've really, like I've, again, I've, I feel very safe with Elise because she's a very, and this is going to be my example of uh, a work that I'm really passionate about, is, which is my, my work as a playwright, uh, because I think Elise is one of the few uh, white dramaturgs that I've encountered who are really conscious about the power they wield and about how they support art that doesn't necessarily align with their experience. Um, and I've seen uh, in the industry a lot of playwrights of color who've had their stories changed or stepped on because of uh, collaborators uh, who are white who don't necessarily, uh, who, make, who make the story about themselves rather than the playwrights. So I think Judith did a really wonderful job making space for us to recognize that. Um, and I think it's really lovely that um, it's like Colette and Elise are very conscious about how they work and what they will work with. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> My name's Adam Corrigan Hollowitz. I'm a, a director, dramaturg, and playwright, and I'm the founding artistic director of El Vigo Root Theatre in London, Ontario. And I'm in my I'm going into my fourth year at York. I'm actually technically one credit away from 
qualify for the degree. Um, but, and um, in the fall as well, as kind of one of my final year projects, I'm the student dramaturg for Rochdale by David Yee and um, being directed by Nina Leakino. And I'm currently directing and adapting The Boy with an R in His Hand in London, Ontario uh, by James Rainey. So, so my first introduction, so these are my three tactics. My first introduction to working in theater uh, were with artists who were making their own work and were generating their own work. This is when I was in high school and even a bit of grade school, I'd kind of go and be the the kid who would hang out and watch people working. And so generating my own work has kind of become my mode of operation as well. It's become, it's what I knew and it's what I know. So I was really fortunate that I had that background. And it, when I was in high school and as well in university and, and in college, I was producing my own work uh, under the company El Vigo Root, which has been growing since I was young and is starting to become a, a, a more mature entity at this point. So the benefit of that is that over this time I've been able to build some really good relationships with producing partners and with funders uh, to support our work. And I think it comes to a, a point that, uh, that Saba made a bit as well, which when you're producing your own work, it's so important to be making sure you're funding your own work when you're producing it. So that's kind of my, my first step. My first step I've been really conscious about is making my own work. And the mandate of El Vigo Root Theatre is to produce and develop plays by London, Ontario and Southwestern Ontario playwrights. And what I'm really interested in is presenting the voice and aesthetic of Southwestern Ontario, which is the region really south of the GTA, Toronto, south of Kitchener-Waterloo, that kind of from, you know, south of Kitchener-Waterloo to Windsor to the border, that area is, is kind of the area I'm interested in. It's the area I grew up in. I'm from London, and it's where I draw a lot of my inspiration from as a playwright as well as a dramaturg and a, a director. So what's changed for the company really is since I completed my preliminary dramaturgy training is looking at running this company now from the point of view of a dramaturg opposed from a director-producer. And that kind of brings me to my, my next strategy that I've been really aware of this spring especially, which is slowing down as I move out of the academy, out of training and into the professional realm, slowing down my producing, my, my development cycle, both as a playwright and as a, the, a dramaturg on the projects I'm working on. Uh, you know, sometimes the work I've been part of creating the past. When you're in school, you have limited time, you have limited resources sometimes. So the outside projects you create, sometimes about six months of development, which is a very, very compressed time, depending on the project. But for me, it feels like a compressed time. So what I've been really aware of is slowing down the development of the works I'm working on. And next year, that's leading me right now to decide that the works I'm going to produce are mostly going to be works that we have previously done, the revivals of, of previous productions or the presenting of other people's work, or the, a new production of a, of a previously produced and previously written play, just to slow us down in that development time. I feel like when I come out of school, I'm going at this speed and I just need to go back a little bit and, and, and slowing down. And then my third strategy is more of a mindset that I've been thinking of and um, it was it, what Aaron described in Hamilton. I, it's a similar dynamic to the dynamic of London. And I would think, I would go on a limb and say, I think it's a similar dynamic to a lot of mid-sized to small Canadian cities where you can come out of school and it's very easy to become a hobbyist or not get started get paid for your work. So one of the, the mindset that I've been really conscious of is as I work in London is that I say I'm based in London, but I'm not stuck in London. I have friends who, can, who have fallen into that trap and realize they're in that trap of going, oh boy, I'm only doing work in this little enclave of people. I'm not getting out, I'm not traveling, I'm not doing work elsewhere, and I'm not even, and, and sometimes if you're in that stuck mentality, you get to the point where you're not even really looking for opportunities outside of your little, your little bubble. So I've been really aware of looking for work 
opportunities, education opportunities across Canada, because it's really, I think, important at my stage, and I think often when you're emerging as a dramaturg, to really be aware of the theater cultures across the country. Especially for me, my work is really about regionalism. So if I'm going to do a good job, hopefully, doing regional dramaturgy, I need to be aware of what the other regions are like, what's happening across the country. So the project, a project that I've been really excited about that I'm working on currently and been working on since November and will continue to be working on until probably around next November is with another company in London, a new professional company that's starting in London called Troubadour Theatre. And I've been working as the co-dramaturg on their inaugural playwrights unit. And when I was invited to join Troubadour, uh, one of the things that I said right away was I want to focus on, on dramaturgy resources for London. This was really important to me, and this was one of the reasons I came on board to be part of that company. And this is partly because of my appreciation of, of the cultural past, the artistic past of the London area. In the late 50s and in the 60s, London was a really an epicenter of, of counterculture art, especially visual art. People like Jack Chambers and Greg Curnow, who you can, if, if you're not aware of their work, you can Google and see some really amazing visual art. Also the pioneering Canadian dramatist James Rainey, lived and worked in London for most of his life. He was a professor at university, or um, at the University of Western Ontario, and he did a lot of the development of his work in that area. His most famous work, and probably the most famous play to come out of London, is the Donnelly Trilogy, which is the documentation of the massacre of the Donnelly family, not from a sensationalized point of view, but from a point of view of asking why did this happen, what's this community like? It's a very powerful piece of theater and worth reading, I think, uh, and worth seeing if you get the chance. So in all of Rainey's work, Rainey's where I get my inspiration from a lot, because in all of Rainey's work, even if it's not pronounced, his plays are saturated with regionalism of southwestern Ontario. And then again, in the 1990s to about 2010, there was this kind of second wave of, of independent theater being made in London. Uh, often on a small budget, and then as the resources weren't there for that work to develop further, it, it um, moved away. The artists moved away from that area. So there's now a new wave of theatre makers who've kind of gravitated to London in the last couple of years. Young actors and directors who can't afford to live in Toronto or choose to live in a smaller centre. We're a bit further away, we're a bit more uh, our own place than the cities around the GTA. So you get a sense of being somewhere a bit different. So these artists I really felt was important to be started to provide a dramaturgy resource for them. So in the first dramaturgy, um, in the first playwright unit for Troubadour, we've um, approached, we, we selected four playwrights from the application process who have been um, from emerging to, um, to established points in their career. And a lot of the work they're doing right now is, the work that's being done in London right now is magic realism. A lot of it I see as kind of being a rejection of the kind of commercial theater that was being done in London, both professionally and in the amateur realm, kind of since that second wave of independent theater stopped in the city. So I've really been excited about starting to provide a resource for them for their development of these works, which are really exciting and also to be being sure that in the workshopping of the plays we're hiring professional actors to be part of that process at that point. So that, that's the project I'm really excited about right now. The, um, I've been really um, excited about returning to London out of the academy and there's a lot of challenges and complications that also arise when you're doing work that's distinctly regional. I'm being really aware of right now deciding what voices I'm actually uh, document or giving resources to, making sure that we actually are truly reflecting the, um, the community that is there. And that's uh, something that I'm just starting on and there's a lot of challenges and complications with that. But that's what I'm excited about right now.
My name is Elise Lacroix. Um, I use she, her, hers pronouns. I grew up in Vancouver and in Burlington, Ontario, which is just outside of Hamilton. Um, and currently, I'm finishing up my MA at the University of Alberta. Um, I am a dramaturgy intern with Workshop West Playwrights Theatre in Edmonton, uh, the editorial assistant on the collection Performing Exile Foreign Bodies. Um, and I have presented my research on dramaturgy at the CATR conference, the Canadian Association of Theatre Research Conference, this year and last year. And I'm also a freelance dramaturg. <laughs> Lots of things. Um, the topic of my thesis research is how intercultural development dramaturgy relationships are navigated with a focus on dramaturgs working in Toronto, um, which I'm actually presenting about on a panel right after this at 3.30. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, Like my colleagues up here with me, I discovered dramaturgy in undergrad and did a fantastic playwriting cl class at York University in Toronto, uh, where I had the chance to work directly with student playwrights to start developing my own practice. The question, of course, became, which is at the center of this panel discussion, how to move from working with fellow students in undergrad to the professional world. Um, directly out of my undergraduate degree, I chose to enter grad school. So now that I come to the end of my second degree, I find myself in the middle of the process of building my own bridge between the academy and the profession. But I did not just start this process now. I have been pushing to get opportunities to work as a dramaturg beyond the academy for years now. Um, the first significant step I took to start doing dramaturgy outside of school began during my undergrad, once I figured out dramaturgy was something I loved. Um, I made the title Dramaturg part of the story I tell about myself to others. I'm Elise, I'm a dramaturg, and in many cases, this was followed by a brief explanation of what that means, um, <laughs> and how it could be helpful to whoever I was speaking with. It's incredible how many opportunities can appear in and out of school just because people know you as a dramaturg and how that might help them. Besides simply telling everyone I encounter that I am a dramaturg and what that is, uh, the second significant step I have taken towards working in the profession involves active pursuit of opportunities. I think about the dramaturg's role as relational, which it is. The dramaturg exists in relationship to artists and to their work. What would the role of the dramaturg be without artists to work with? Um, part of my own journey of doing work outside of school has involved actively pursuing opportunities I'm interested in and not just waiting for someone to say, hey, I want to work with you. Um, and in some cases, actually creating opportunities where they didn't exist before, um, because I wasn't excited about what I was finding and the projects that were happening around me. Um, as a result of simply approaching people I want to work with and offering to be support to their process, I have worked um, on many fringe shows with the Emerging Artist Project at Little Black Afro Theatre Company, um, and on a few main stage productions at the U of A. By the second year of my master's program, however, I honestly was missing working with playwrights on new work. Production dramaturgy is much better known at the U of A, and that's the opportunities that I was having out there. So I approached the artistic director of the Next Stage Festival, um, a new works festival for current students and recent al alumni at the U of A, about possibly being the dramaturg for the festival. The position was already filled. <laughs> so the AD and I ended up working together to create a playwrights unit as part of the festival. Um, which I coordinated and served as dramaturg for. As well as the produced shows as part of the traditional festival format, four playwrights were chosen as part of the unit, whom I worked with for several months, culminating in a stage reading of the scripts in development. Creating my own opportunity gave me the chance to try things the way I wanted to, to take everything I had learned in and out of school and attempt to create the best environment for the four playwrights to foster their work and to develop as artists on my own terms. This kind of opportunity for emerging playwrights has not existed at the U of A for quite some time, and I'm happy to say that they're continuing the Playwrights Unit next year. Um, the third and perhaps most significant step I've taken towards a professional career in dramaturgy has been what I've done with my choice to go back to school and get a degree, degree in which I conducted my own original research. Leaving my undergrad, I wanted to make my graduate school experience part of bridging my dramaturgy work from school into the profession. I knew I wanted to learn more about dramaturgy and to learn more about interculturalism and Canadian theatre. For my research, I chose to interview six dramaturgs with experience working across cultures in Toronto. I picked people with experience related to my topic and also people who I honestly just wanted to have a chance to sit down and talk to. In the interviews, I asked questions that related both to the theoretical side of my research, but also to the practical side of the dramaturgy profession. The six people I spoke with were incredibly generous. I learned more about how to navigate the complexity of the profession than I could possibly have done just seeking out opportunities to work with my peers, and I started professional relationships with some very accomplished people who I greatly respect and admire. 
Out of this, I realized that I don't need to have the excuse of doing thesis research to talk to people. Uh, drama Turks are generally very generous people um, who are genuinely curious about the work um, that, that would like to talk to you if you're genuinely curious about their work. Um, since last summer when I finished my formal research, I returned to Edmonton and started approaching artists in the community, asking if they would talk to me about their work. Among those that I agreed to meet with you was Vern Thiessen at Workshop West Playwright Theatre. I met with him at the company office. We talked about dramaturgy and Canadian theatre. Unlike in my interviews where the focus was mostly on the person I was interviewing, I had the opportunity with Vern to talk about myself, what I love about dramaturgy, what I think about the work being done at Workshop West, and what I want going into the theatre world after school, as well as to ask Vern all the questions I wanted to ask him. This led to the work I'm doing right now, which I'm very excited about, a grant-funded dramaturgy internship with Workshop West that started in January, and it's still ongoing. Throughout the winter, I was reading script submissions and helping to support the season in various ways. Now that I've defended my thesis, my work with the company has started to increase. What I'm working on right now is providing dramaturgical support for the first show in the 2018-2019 season, Matara by Connie Massing. It's fantastic. Um, as well as developing the outreach plans for the production and working to find funding and community partners for the production as well. Um, this opportunity being my first dramaturgy-related work in an institution it's given me experience working to support new works and development at the organizational level, which I'm very excited about. Um, and just before I conclude, what in this short presentation sounds like the very straightforward story of how I worked to enter into the dramaturgy profession, um, I want to add that this process has been both very rewarding and extraordinarily challenging at times. Uh, part of why I feel at home in the role of a dramaturg is that I prefer to ask questions and listen when talking to others. Um, learning how to articulate my story to people especially people I have just met, is an ongoing process. Approaching people and asking them for their time or asking them for opportunities um, when they're not existent is terrifying. Um, asking for what I want, I have been told no countless times. And every rejection is difficult. But I have gained so much from asking and taking those risks. As for right now, as I move forward, now that I am finishing my master's thesis, I will continue focusing on the opportunity in front of me with Workshop West, and as well as the challenge of working and talking with people about my interests in dramaturgy and actively seeking out opportunities to practice what I'm most passionate about, which is working with artists to develop new Canadian stories for our stages. Thank you. Thank you for offering your perspectives, all very different, yet there are things that do thread through that you can recognize. Sometimes not articulated the same way, but definitely that need to put a foot out into that profession, no matter how scary it is, and make contact with people actively, not, not just have coffee, but actually talk to them, and reveal a little bit about what you want. Um, is there anybody in the audience that has a question, either for any of the panelists, or uh, something that they want to express about their own journey? Mm -hmm. So um, I feel like I have one of the threads in terms of your experiences, both just as New York University grads, um, and also uh, just actually mostly as New York University grads, <laughs> um, that I, that's really awesome, that sounds super helpful in terms of your playwriting unit, um, was the connections that you had there. And I, so I just graduated from my undergraduate program at Boston University in May, so I am like, I'm like a month into early career. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I went to a primarily performance-based program that got into dramatic literature and text and something that I could focus on a little bit more in the upper years, while simultaneously pursuing a degree in political science. So I'm sorry that I'm a niche, and I'm talking in niche. But um, I'm interested in, uh, if you guys have any thoughts at where you're at right now, um, of how, I don't feel like I had, I didn't take the opportunity, mm, I had to have a secret, what do I want to say? I didn't have the internships over the summers in the same way that I feel like you guys have articulated, and that's something that I'm still interested in pursuing, but I, I'm worried that like my, my youth is done because I'm no longer in the university setting. And so I'm curious like how you might navigate that if if, your, if my experience with like introducing myself to professional companies in that way is already the post-grad stage. Does that make sense? Does that question make sense? Cool. Um. I'm actually in the same boat because all my internships came after school. Okay. Because um, I trained as a playwright and dramaturgy was like just a year ago. Yeah. Um, my main thing is I just meet with ADs and we, we shoot the shit. And yeah. then um, I make an, at some point during the conversation, things are going well, I ask them for something specific. 
Okay. Um, and I think the fact that you're eager, the fact that like you know a lot of the poli sci, which is really exciting, because <laughs> like that's that's a big skill, um, especially with what's going uh, down where you're from. Oh. Um, yeah, but I'd say just like meet with them and do the ask. Okay. Age isn't anything. Uh, one of my favorite actors in the city was working an administrative job for a bunch of years. She's like in her late thirties, and she's like booking all of these things now. Mm. And she had no acting training beside uh, Yolanda Bunnell is her name. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, she didn't act before, went to theater school at like 32, 36, went to Stratford, and now <laughs> So age is not a factor. And I also think just the fact that like your training is so, it, you're in two different pots is really exciting, especially for an AD or anyone who's looking at working on something in the political sphere. Cool. So I'd say don't feel intimidated by that. Yeah. No. I would add to that that before you contact an artistic director, learn everything mm -hmm. you can about them and their theater. Okay. So don't go in and ask high school questions. Right. Yeah. It's like, what does your theater do? You know, what's your mandate? So you know, we have this thing called the internet that's very helpful. Yeah. So and don't call them the day after an opening. Right. <laughs> Anybody else want to answer that? Or speak to that. I'm so same as Aaron. It's like political science. I'm just like, whoa, that is something like very cool to advertise about yourself as a dramaturg. Like I think when you're you're going out into the profession, like you have to identify what's special about you as a dramaturg, like, and like really like practice like um, writing like what is your descriptor as a dramaturg? What are the areas you specialize in, or what you can offer people? The dramaturg, mm -hmm. and it is a, it's a lifelong career. And like theater changing. is, like I know a lot of people really don't like they say overnight success, but it's really like ten years of putting right. in the work. So yeah. you yeah. gotta be ready for the long haul. Yeah. Yeah. Try and figure out a way that if somebody says, "Tell me about yourself," mm -hmm. you have an answer for it that mm -hmm. has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Learn how not to be embarrassed to identify who you are and what you want. Right, that's how you sell yourself. Because yeah. they don't know. And that goes so far beyond what's written on a resume or a CV. What else? Yeah, Lisa. Hi, uh, Lisa, you she, her pronouns. Um, and I'm curious because so many of you spoke about your hyphenates and the many roles that you sort of necessarily and probably very much enjoy playing. Um, I was wondering if I could ask the panel at large uh, how you negotiate how you advertise, she's a terribly neoliberal word, uh, your hyphenates when, when meeting new mentors, when pursuing new opportunities, because I imagine some can be leveraged in some situations and some cannot. I'm coming from a very academic background right now, and I feel like sometimes trying to advertise myself as the uh, artist academic can be a bit of a, a drawback. People hear academic and they're just like, oh, you're just going to come in and criticize everything you do and tell me how my work is problematic. And I mean, yes, I have. But maybe that's what I can be doing to help. So I'm just curious how you, like you, you mentioned that you like the term creative producer. And I'm just wondering if you want to elaborate on that or if other people want to chime in with how they negotiate, what their hyphens are, what's on their business card, and how that changes depending on what work you're um, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's a really challenging uh, thing to negotiate, and I I struggled with that for a very long time. Especially like when Judith asked me to be here, I was like, "Am I a dramaturg? I'm not sure." And then I realized I was. <laughs> um, and I think it really, I think people have so many skills and and I think we live in this climate where we put each other in boxes and those boxes don't exist anymore like we don't we don't make theater in in separate rooms like we all come together and we share ideas and so that's being reflected in how we talk about ourselves as artists and so this is why terms like creative producer artist producer and the term producer itself is being expanded it is because our practices are expanding. So I think it's less about what uh, you want to do specifically in a room and more about what your mandate is as an artist and what you stand for and who you want to work with. And that's definitely how I got into rooms. Uh, once I uh, articulated what I stand for, my career blew up. Um, and so it's, 
like you can call yourself whatever you want, but I'm gonna work with you because I like you and, and we're gonna do good things together. I really feel like the three kind of titles that I always throw on my bio, director, dramaturg, playwright, they really are all equal thirds of, of what I am and they, and they all inform what I do. I learn so much about being a dramaturg from working with my dramaturg is when I'm a playwright and I'm in that space. And then directing new work as well is something that informs that. So I, like all three of those things, that's, I, it's interesting because I had kind of thought for a while, is there a better one word title I can give myself? But they really do inform me and they're equally, they're equally all things that I really, really am passionate about and I really love doing. And I wouldn't be happy if I suddenly wasn't doing one of those three. It's interesting though, depending on the show, I realize subconsciously I reorder the three. <laughs> and depending on who I'm about to talk to, I reorder the three. And I'm, I'm analyzing now why that is. And because there seems, there appears to be on the surface no rhyme or reason, but I'm realizing they're saying things about my, you know, insecurities or securities in certain areas That's and certain... That's what you're trying to sell. Yeah, right? what I'm trying to sell. It's the same way when you tailor a resume to yeah. apply for a job. You're going to change your order of things depending on who you want to talk to. Yes. Uh, my name is Ariane. Um, I want to uh, follow up your, your question with the same thing at a different stage in life. Because after four other careers and, <laughs> and creating met a couple of the major institutions that now exist in the United States for citizen accountability on corporate responsibility mm -hmm. and on climate change as a financial issue. I was teaching that and discovered and took a class, an acting class, and another and a lot of directing classes, and dramaturgy is what I love. And I'm absolutely a dramaturg in the way I've done everything all my life. You know, and uh, you know, it's all about bridging and interpreting cultures and whether it's within a corporation or across foreign languages. So, but I just want to add to it that my experience is um, when you have the opportunity to meet with someone in an AD role or, you know, I, I blew one once, but once, once she said, let's meet, and it's for a longer conversation, I then put my ask in the email. And she, of course, and not you know, yeah. she should have just got, gotten together and then found the right specific thing. So that was very painful, lesson to learn. Um, and then the other thing is, is I've decided I can't do online uh, in, in internship applications because they always ask for your birthday. And there's such an ageism and assumption that everybody applying is going to be very young. And I want to show that I have a huge amount to offer, especially in drama you know, I've studied 10 languages and yeah. so on. Uh, and if they see my birthday, it's just going to disqualify me right away. So that's that's a strange thing. So I need to understand how to do the networking in a way, particularly also at my age. They assume I'm a professor. I have been a professor, but um, but to sort of speak as an as an equal, kind of socially and professionally, and then find a way of working with them, oddly instead of working for them. So that's kind of. Interesting thing that's going on in my life. Is that you may, I want to work in this area, and I can't go through the regular applications route, or I just get turned out. I don't even get an answer. Thank you for sharing that. It's, it moves me deeply. I think the best response I would have to that is try to get, in, if whether it's formal or informal meetings in person, and share who you are. Yeah. You know, I think there's there's going to be ages, and we know it exists, and it sucks. And there's no way around that. But I think you're probably absolutely right that if you're doing something on paper and you're just a piece of your name and a number, then you're going to be dismissed a lot faster than if you're actually given a space in the room to make your case. And then you've got to sell. Yeah. You know, this is meeting Daryl Roth, a wonderful producer in New York. And she had actually just addressed the League of Professional Theater Women, saying, you know, women who've had children and had other careers and then go th into this, mm -hmm. she was really urging that. And that's what I had done. So I spoke to her right, with a warm welcome, but um, didn't quite realize how to, you know, how to 
We have to position. Ease, have ease into it rather than be wanting yeah, There's someone. also the negotiation between positioning yourself as a sage and positioning yourself as a seeker. Yeah. Because it looks like you're, you need to do both. Yeah. And I don't know how to do that. Yeah. But that, that, yeah, that, that's, that's the negotiation. It's a right angle, yeah. I don't know if any of you guys have websites. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. So I feel like if you were to advertise yourself as like a director, or, like an actor, or, like something with, with more material or like tactile like things, like you can have photos and like images and like videos. As a drama director, like how do you advertise your work? Because often it doesn't actually like, it's not your specific like work that comes to fruition, but it's like the process of the actual material. So like how would you advertise that as like, a portfolio area in like whatever? Um, I advertise it uh, very visually with those yeah. photos and then I don't necessarily like write an essay about it on my website but I do whip up a paragraph about the artist, uh, the work that they're doing and how I helped. Um, I think that's enough for a website and uh, those deeper conversations tend for me to happen in person with the people. Um, and I think a website is just a really handy tool to make a make your resume look really beautiful. And uh, so I have um, so I've thought very carefully about how I want to be seen, um, and then whose work uh, I put at the top and in the middle and the bottom. Um, yeah, and I think like less is more. I just find it so powerful. Uh, to say this really small thing about something I'm so proud of, and then I think it speaks volumes. So I've, yeah. So it's like presenting the menu rather than the whole meal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I just had a question about unpaid work. Um, Don't be and, <laughs> um, and finding funding. Mm -hmm. Just uh, something I heard. I was just curious about. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go Great. Ahead. Cool. Uh, <laughs> well, if I'm doing an, the occasional unpaid job, because sometimes I break my rule, um, it's what am I getting out of it? That's the flip side. Like, um, am I getting something that's rewarding? That can. My, my whole thing is like, if I have a shift at my catering job, which pays me eighteen dollars an hour and gives me a free meal, what will stop me from going there to work in this unpaid project? So I Venn diagram that. If I'm doing unpaid work, that's my that's my debacle. Um, in terms of funding, um, it depends on what you're, what you're working on. I know with Theatre Ontario, I have a PTTP training grant, which um, if you're an Ontario resident, I don't know if you are, um, ooh. <laughs> so this, this advice might not be helpful for you at all, but um, in Ontario there exists um, a training grant where you can, several training grants, where you design your own curriculum with a mentor in the city, and you just say, I want to get paid X amount of dollars for this amount of hours, um, and Theatre Ontario says yes, or Theatre Ontario says no. There's a lot of other steps too, but um, that's kind of that's kind of the way I'm able to fund my training. Um, also, the Toronto Arts Council, Ontario Arts Council, and Canada Council have um, grants where you can apply for workshop funding, so you make sure you get paid a wage there. I find, and maybe this is like a tangent when we talk about grant writing, but like a good grant to me is like a good story. Um, I, having been on the TAC jury. Um, you're writing, anybody can read grant speak. I know when I was on the TAC jury, we threw out the grants that were full of grant speak because they bored us. It was like, yes, you have to seem competent, yes, but it's like, you're there because you're a storyteller. You're there because the story is important. You're there because, and there are a bunch of tangible things that they do help, so don't totally throw out the grant speak, but you're there to tell them a story. And that's, to me, how you get funding. And of course, you have to do an actual budget, and you have to like actually figure out, so you're not saying, I'm gonna make a million dollars tonight, but. Yeah, it's an interesting negotiation between making your, your story stand out and then having the facts to back up yep. why they should give you the money. Mm -hmm. But if you can do that, we are fortunate here in that we do have a lot of funding bodies. I don't know how many of them are going to last through the current provincial, <laughs> yeah, provincial government, which is slicing and dicing. We call him Trump Light. Trump Light. Yeah. <laughs> What I was going to add to that is I, the also, I think, is really important finding producing partners. And that's yes. nice gets, um, <clears throat> in my experience at least, I find the producing partner, finding a partner comes before getting the grant. Because then you're able to show that you have that support you already. Have the network. Yeah. You have the network. You know, for the, and it, and it doesn't always have to be the obvious one either. 
uh, five years ago, I struck up a partnership with a heritage museum in the London area that has an old barn. Now we do the shows in, the, in, in an old barn, uh, and all my friends said, well, this, that's, people are going to think it's stodgy, they're going to think, oh my goodness, this is, why, why are we going out to this, you know, place that was fairly, a, 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 around the place, they, I jokingly said, it's a museum of waspiness, because, <laughs> because it is, it was, but it's developed and it's growing, and the work we've been able to get going there has been really different, and really outside of what people expect in that setting. So there was, an, there was an example that people were going, oh, it's not even going to work, or is anyone going to come? They had a great venue, they gave given us so much support in kind, and from there the, the funding followed. And what we've been able to do is push um, what even was considered history, and push what was considered content that could be seen in there in some really exciting places. And that's, that's still the beginning journey, but I'm excited about that. And to jump on that too, a partner um, makes the project more viable because it ensures that you have resources already ready to go. So the moment you get funding, you can run with it. So definitely, yeah. And at the back. What are some of the questions that you like to ask of people as you are looking into having a producing relationship? Uh, and make sure it's going to be, a, 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 what you say, a, an equal, tenable, um, good experience for you. I, I once worked on a project where the producer was trying to build power to change things. And obviously, you can have conversations early on to try to uh, negotiate that before it becomes an issue, but what, what do you feel are some of the best ways to find people who will be the best people for you? It's a big question. It's a big I think what I look for with anyone I want to work with is, is if there's an element, if they trust me and if I trust them. And you can almost in a moment know if someone trusts you or not. And as a director, I've been in situations too where I realized the person wasn't trusting me, wasn't trusting what I saw could be done with the work. And in those places, I say, that was really good. I don't think it's going to turn out. So I think, I think gay, asking yourself after that first meeting, do I feel like I'm being trusted by this potential partner? To me, that's the most important one, I think. I think there's also no guarantees. Yeah. I think we've all been in positions where we thought it was going to be a great partnership and three weeks into it, it's like, what the hell? You know, run screaming into the night. But are there, are there particular things that you look for when you're putting together a partnership or when you're trying to figure out if this is this? Like if it's a first time partnership, I think contracts help and just Absolutely. Like, like put it down on paper. Thing. Especially if I'm working for free or honorarium, like I have to really, like be honest about the amount of hours that you mm -hmm. commit to a project. Yeah, I recommend that to anybody who's going out, whether you're experienced or emerging, is put down on paper what both of you have at, what both of you have as your expectation, whether it's in terms of hours, duties and responsibilities, money, and sign it. I mean, it's probably not worth the paper it's written on legally, but it certainly gives you both something, a document to work from. Anything else that you look for when you're, you're trying to figure out if something's going to be a feasible partnership? Do you know what I do? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what do you do, Elise? No, that's the, Tell us. That's the question. That's the question oh. I ask. Oh. Is, do you know what I do? <laughs> Sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I do? <laughs> Sorry. Um, just, uh, yeah, oh. that, that's one of the, when I'm working Thanks, with a human. Hello, Luke. <laughs> uh, I want to make sure that they know that what I do and what I can bring to them, so that when and when we're that's where a contract comes really really in handy because you can you can say this is what I can do. So three weeks down the line, you're like I I really want my voice to be heard, and you're like, hearing me. Well, you knew that I was going to be doing this. Why are you upset that I'm doing this? Or you didn't. I didn't say I was going to do that. Why do you think I'm going to? So it's. Um, because there's so much misinformation and misunderstanding about what a dramaturg does, but also every dramaturg is so different. So you can't assume that I'm going to bring the same thing to the process as anyone up here um, might bring to the process. That is my addition to that. I do coffee. That's my thing. We do coffee and we talk about anything but theater for the first 30 minutes. Um, I usually ask them what their, what their favorite movies are, what their favorite plays are. So you basically what you date them. I date them. <laughs> it's, it's speed dating. That's, that's my process. Like, we sit down and from that first meeting I can tell within those first 30 minutes, just like any other date, 
um, is this gonna work or am I going to leave immediately? Um, just because like it's so personal. Like even if I really care about your project, um, or like or or like the everything excites me about it, if we're not gonna click or we're, if we're not gonna get along, then I'm not the right person for you. Because it's so personal. Even though when we are getting paid, there's so much emotional labor into it, potentially. So I want to make sure that like. It's a good experience, even if we don't like the same movies, that at least like we're cool. Anybody else? Yeah, one more. Um, this, might, this might be an oddly specific question, but um, like the, the program in the university that I come from is very, it's very design oriented and, and then performance oriented. So there, there really wasn't a uh, drum surgical uh, concentration per se. But I think one of the opportunities that it kind of afforded me was because it was more design oriented and I did start in the, the technical production concentration, um, was as a dramaturg, I kind of got a lot, a lot of experience working directly with designers. Um, but as, as I was kind of on my way out, I was told that this isn't, um, don't expect to kind of do this on a regular basis because there is a, a separation of designers and dramaturgs. Um, and, and, I'm, and because the program isn't geared towards what I do, I was just curious, is that your experience, like, has that been your experience, or was, is, is that something that I just shouldn't believe, because that's, that's really been something that I've been having a difficult time uh, trying to figure out as I navigate uh, starting my professional career, is I have a lot of skills that are geared towards um, aiding designers, and so kind of hearing that was very uh, jarring and kind of terrifying, because I, I felt like that was uh, kind of ripping the carpet out from under me right as I'm about to step into the career. It's what makes you unique. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know the old expression, you've got to have a gimmick. I mean, you, you come with a training that not everybody has. I would say that's a positive, not a negative. Mm -hmm. It may not work for each job, mm -hmm. but I would think that people would kill for that kind of experience. I think, I think. I, well, just a, last year at the Blythe Festival, credit I think on almost every show was visual dramaturg. Mm -hmm. There was one person who was, as their visual dramaturg, did the yeah. video design as well, but was, I thought, how brilliant. This is a company and a directors who are really aware of thinking about what's being seen. And I think one of Canada's great ones, Robert Lepage, there's someone who combines directing and, and visual or a dramaturgy of visuals. That's, that's what he does. That's, that's not, I, th I don't know, personally, I feel like we separate the visual and the design from the acting and the, the words so much, but they're really all in one. I love design. I think it combines together so much. I mean, I think you'll have to figure out when you're looking for work, what are the companies and who are the artists who will acknowledge and accept what you're offering. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be for everybody, but yeah, absolutely. We have people here who do that as their primary job. Yeah. Anybody else? I think that's time. We're at 3.15. Thank you so much for not going on the bus tour. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we were fighting with? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much.